because I knew nothing about martial arts at the time. I knew what I saw on television. And what you see on television is not what martial arts is. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 762. My guest today is Sensei Joseph Johnson. I'm Jeremy Lesney. I'm your host here for the show. I founded Whistlekick because I love martial arts, traditional martial arts, training, connecting with people. And that's why we do all the things that we do. And our mantra, our slogan is even connect, educate, and entertain. If you want to connect with us, see all the things we're doing to help you connect with others, to educate yourself in various aspects of the martial arts, as well as, well, keep you entertained, go to whistlekick.com. You're going to find a bunch of stuff over there. It's our online home, and it's where you can learn all about our projects and our products. Speaking of products, if you find something in the store, you can save 15% with the code PODCAST15. Now, if you want to go deeper on this show, Martial Arts Radio, you can go to a completely separate website. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com is the place. You can do everything over there from check out every single episode we've ever made with links, photos, videos, transcripts, all kinds of great deeper stuff. You can also sign up for our newsletter. You could submit a suggestion for a guest or a topic for a future episode. You could even throw us a tip. Now, if you do want to help the show and Whistlekick in general in our mission, there are a ton of ways you can help us. Pretty much anything you could think of would be of value. But here are a few you might consider. Sharing an episode with someone. Share it on social media, text it to them, I don't know, print it out on a piece of paper and tape it to their steering wheel. Whatever works for you, that will work for us. You could also maybe grab one of our books on Amazon. We have a number of books. Some come out of this podcast, some are from other things. But we've also got a Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash whistlekick. The lowest tier on the Patreon is two bucks a month, and you're going to find out what guests are coming up on the show. You can also join our live monthly hangouts. But it goes up from there. And the more you're willing to contribute, the more we're going to give back to you. Bonus and exclusive audio, video episodes, drafts of books and training programs, so much stuff in there. And if you haven't checked it out, you should probably check it out. But if you want the entire list, all the things you can do to help us, if you do consider yourself part of the Whistlekick family, you should be checking out whistlekick.com slash family. It's a page we update weekly. It is free. It's all the things you can do to help us in our mission. And we even give you some bonus, again, exclusive behind the scenes stuff. I've known today's guest for a few years. I won't say I know him well, but I certainly know him better now than I did. But what I've always appreciated about Sensei Joe is that he is an incredibly kind man. And yet that's a bit surprising that I know him in that way when he talks about his past. So hang on, and we're going to learn a bit more about one of the nicest men I know. Hey, Joe, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, sir. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm wonderful. Yeah. I've been looking forward to doing this for a while. You know, um, I'll, I'll tell the audience, I don't even know how long I've known you. I don't remember when we became friends, right? Most people, you can say, this thing happened and I started to get to know them better. But I feel like my friendship with you was just instant. One day I didn't know you and then we were friends. (laughs) Yes. Do you remember? I remember I got to know you more when we were setting up for whistle kicks at the uh, friendship tournament. That's right. That's right. You were one of the the people at your school that helped me out. Yes. Yeah. But it's, but it, I don't know. Our friendship just kind of works. You're, you're just a great guy. And I'm, that's why I'm glad you're here. We, we just, we just seem to have some of the same um, philosophies. Yeah. I, I would agree. So if we can't define when it really, how our friendship started beyond it just kind of did, how about, the start of your time in martial arts. That's probably a little bit clearer. So if people see me, they see this uh, kind of a um, more advanced in years with gray hair, gray mustache, Mm -hmm. all of this. Um, They seem to say, think that I've been in martial arts for 30 or 40 years. Mm. 
And most people that are in martial arts and look like me have been in since they were teenagers. Right. Mine started when I was 42, about 17 mm. years. Okay. So I haven't been in as long as some of you. What, what, what prompted you at 42 to say, hey, I'm going to go do this thing and get punched in the face? So some backstory on me, a little bit of backstory. At 42, I was not the man that you got to know. Mm. I was an angry individual. Uh, didn't let anybody that close to me because I didn't trust myself. So how am I going to trust other people, right? Grew up in kind of a hard environment. But um, I had a friend that I hadn't been in touch with in a couple of years. And I saw him out and he told me he was doing Jukadu. Was the first thing I asked him was, what's that? And he said, it's martial arts, you know, and he had a free pass for me to come and, and, and view a class. So I went because it would get me out of the house and get me away from people <laughs> that, that, you know. And um, once I took the class, I says, well, you know, I'll do this for a month and get out of my family's hair and, and it will, you know, divert me. So a month turned into 17 years, mm. so, you know. Now, you and I have talked a bit about the man you were and the man you are now. And, and the contrast is shocking me because I, I didn't know you back then. But I know you as a very kind, very gentle, uh, loving person. And you've described yourself to me in the past as being very angry. Yes. To the point where, you know, you uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think you've even told me in the past you were surprised you did not get a divorce. Yes. Absolutely. So if if we if we think about where you are and obviously martial arts has played a role in your growth in that transition right. from then to now. Was it something that you were were first off, were you aware of how angry you were back then? Oh yes, oh absolutely. I was angry. I grew up angry because I grew okay. up in a a a, a abusive household so i grew up angry and an angry child grows up into an angry man didn't like where my life was leading didn't like myself so therefore i couldn't really like other people or trust them so no i knew i was angry i was angry every day to the point of my seven-year-old at the time went to her mother my wife and said is dad always mad is he never happy so, you know, when something like that happens, a light hits that you have to do something. Hmm. How much had you known about martial arts and what maybe it could provide for you ahead of time? Was was when? Let me ask you a different way. When when this person that you knew gave you the free pass and said, you know, mm -hmm. come come train, was there something in your mind that said maybe this is my answer? No, it was because I knew nothing about martial arts at the time. I knew what I saw on television. And, and what you see on television is not what martial arts is. Um, I thought it would give me a diversion. That, that first class would give me a diversion away from my, my world and reality. To give me a, a break from it for like an hour or however, how long the class was. So it, the expectation wasn't that it would solve the problem. It was that no. it would just create some distance. You could put it down for a moment. And, and I think you even said it here. I know I've heard you say in the past, give your family a break. Yes, because you, you, you have to realize, I didn't think there was a solution to the problem other than me not being mm -hmm. would have been the only solution. Okay. So, and, and once I got there, the first month passed and I started seeing some tools that I could use. Some, some, some of the uh, self-control stuff, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was some stuff that I could use. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? What, what you were seeing and, and how you were relating to it? Well, because when I grew up, I grew up in a, a, a rural setting in West Virginia where I grew up fighting. There, there was, 
you, you had no choice. There was no bully-free zone in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So there was a kids will be kids theory was, was what all the teachers and all the adults would uh, believe. So I grew up fighting. So I, I knew how to throw a punch. I didn't know how to avoid those situations. And I realized that this gave me a way of controlling myself and my own anger. And in that, if I control myself and my own anger, then I control the situation. If that makes sense. It does. It absolutely does. Was the, you know, was the fact that you had grown up fighting and knew how to throw a punch and were angry, did that scare you in that context? Were you afraid or, or did you act out? Were there, was there As, stuff you were it, bringing in? It did, it did scare me to the point of martial arts. It, it does sh show you how to defend yourself and gives you moves and gives you, give you um, access uh, to how to get out of a situation. But in doing this, not only did I learn self-control, but I learned trust, which is something that I didn't have a lot of at that point in time. I didn't trust people. So when you are in a training situation, you have no choice if it's going to work other than to trust your instructor and trust your grandmaster as, as to how to do things. Um, on that trust issue, I learned a lot about that at my first belt change, going from blue. In my style, we have a ceremony where we change the changing of the belt, where we take you take off your old belt over your shoulder, and you are uh, saying you're done with that rank. The new belt they take, and they you're in a kneeling position, and they take that belt and they do a crisscross on your back as they hit you with a belt. And that signifies uh, ushering out of, of negative energy and ushering in positive energy. But as a child, the only time I ever got that, that belt was a, the belt was a uh, enemy to me because my father used that belt. And I felt that belt quite a bit on my back. So I had to, really trust my grandmaster, my doshu, into putting myself in that position. So that took a lot of inner turmoil on me in my behalf to put that away and mm -hmm. to trust in that procedure, if that makes um, sense at all. Absolutely. How long, not that when the rank changed is really relevant, mm -hmm. but that experience I think is relevant. And I want to talk about the time in between. So right. how, how long had you been training when that, that ceremony occurred? Uh, about a year. Okay. Because white belts test every three months and there's okay. three levels to that. Got so it. close to a year. Okay. What allowed you to trust the people around you over the course of that time, I, I can only imagine that if someone had put a belt across your back, you know, day one or two, oh, yeah. it would have been a really different experience. You know, uh, um, what you're describing is is not unique among disciplinary actions of right. people your age, right? And it leaves uh, an emotional mark. Right. You clearly worked through some of that along the way, else you, you either wouldn't have gone to that ceremony or, or right. you know, left or something maybe right. could have happened. Yeah. How, did, how did that unpack over the year that you were able to, you know, create enough distance that those things didn't occur? Because in, in the training of, in, in the martial arts training, there's a lot of physical um, training that, that goes along. Sure. Um, so that physical training, in my case, left me in a 
I, I want to say exhaustion where you, you know how hard you train sometimes. I want to yeah. say exhaustion where it broke down my mental uh, process to not only do these instructors train and put you through the physical aspects of it, they also talk to you and get to know you, right? So martial arts is not only a, in my mind, is not only a, um, a uh, exercise regime, it becomes a family. And these people in this dojo, the grandmaster and the instructors and, and, and everything, showed me that they care about me. That they care not only because I've, you, you have to remember when I, with the family aspect, because I'm married, I have children, you know, in my mind, they have no choice but to deal with me, right? Because I'm family. They have none. They married me. They, they're stuck with me, is, is what I thought. These people in the dojo made a conscious decision to care about me. So I felt more included. You know, like, like I mattered as an individual. And then when, you, when, when I let myself care about them in return, then I realized, well, you know what? My family also cares about me. Because, you know, they, they didn't have to put up with me. <laughs> you know, especially with the divorce rate the way it is, you know, in this day and age. She didn't have to put up with me. She did it because she cares about me. And that's... And letting myself care about them, someone that's outside of my family, then it kind of made me more vulnerable to mm. my wife and my children, if that makes sense. Was it uncomfortable for for you to recognize that these people who were essentially strangers right. cared about you? At the, in the beginning, absolutely it was. Because... Um, that wall, when in the beginning, that wall of I keep you at this arm's length yeah. was still there. It took six or seven months for that wall to start relaxing. Yeah. And the tournament circuit helped in that aspect. Because in a month in, as I started in April, in June, was our tournament. Yeah. So I, I went to that and I, I says, well, you know, I'll compete in it and see what, what happens. But then I saw these other people from martial arts schools coming from all over New England and, and all over coming to that tournament. And they all acted like they loved each other, like they, they, they were a family, you know? So, so. That also helped break down the walls because it wasn't just this dojo. It wasn't just my personal family. It was people from all over that was in the martial arts community that came together like this. So that made me think, you know what? There's something to this. There might be something to this. And so that kept me in the dojo. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. if you think, well, it's, it's just this school, it's just these people. But then when you go to that tournament where there was 400 people at this tournament, they all acted like, you know, oh, I, I haven't seen you since the last tournament and I've, I've missed you. And they all hug each other and they all, you know, that yeah. that made me say, well, you know, maybe there's something to this. Mm. Because you were aware of your anger because you had been angry for so long, you were probably aware of, the, I'm going to guess there's a, a situation that happened, something happened, mm -hmm. and you realized in the moment that you were not reacting in the same way right. that you might have before. Do you remember one of those early times? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I do, and it, it's funny <laughs> because when I would go to the dojo, I would put my, uh, of course, my, my, my dojo shirt on, I would put my gi pants on. And one day I was going to the dojo, still a white belt, uh, probably, I don't know, I'm going to say six months in, seven months in. 
I stopped to get some water from a convenience store. I walk in. There's a group on the outside of that convenience store. So as I came out, because you know when you have anything martial arts sometimes on you, sometimes certain people, that puts a target on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So these three guys came over, and they were probably in their teenage years, probably 16, 17, you know. They came over, and they're like, oh, you do that martial arts thing. You know, that's all a bunch of BS. That's all a, you know, and and you look like you have pajamas on and all that stuff. And uh, the old me would have done this. Yeah. Right. Postured. But I never backed away from anything as a child, because in my mind, if you run away, they're going to catch you. Hmm. And then you're going to be tired. And then you got, you know, um, and in that moment, I, I saw myself doing this. Okay, guys, you know, I, I really don't want any problems. I just stopped to get some water. You gentlemen have a nice day as I'm backing away to get to my car. So I get into my car and I head to the dojo. I'm thinking, wow. That was completely different. Mm. That could have went a whole other way six months ago. And that's when I realized, you know, there's a change happening. Mm. I'm sure she noticed it before she said anything. But when did your wife first say, you know, I'm, I'm seeing some changes in you? So I have... I, I, I have a big family. Mm-hmm. There were, you know, my, my family had 13 wow. children. My mother had 13 children, and they raised 10 of us. So my brother was up here. He, he lived up here also, mm-hmm. my older brother. And he's, he's like, I can't understand why, why you're doing this. You, you say you were an angry man, but you're learning how to fight. And my wife spoke up and said, um, no, he's not learning how to fight. He's learning how to not fight and how to um, deal with situations. And, she, and he said, well, you're paying money to go to this place. And she says, you know what? Here's this. She said, it's a lot cheaper than a funeral, which was where he was heavy. How did and you that, feel that in that moment? when blue belt or something. How did you feel hearing that? It made me feel... A, sad that I put her through that. Yeah. B, proud that I'm making a difference. I'm stopping. I'm, I'm cutting that link out of that chain. You know, of, of the, the, the violence from the past and carrying all that with me. I'm, I'm, I'm severing that link. Yeah. And that's going to help my children. And their children, even, yeah, in the future. So that that made me feel, like, yeah, no, you're going to keep going. And that was the point when I, I was a blue belt. That was the point that I thought, you know what, I'm going to keep going. No matter what the belts are, I'm going to keep going because this is good for me and my family. Do you ever think about stopping? Not once. No. Not once. I've had moments where I was tired. I've had moments where I've sat in the dojo and thought, man, uh, I really shouldn't have come tonight because I'm really not feeling, you know, the best, you know. And we had, I had an instructor that taught me my first class. His name was Richard Paul. He has since uh, passed away. He came out of the dojo, and this man had a continuous insulin pump on. He had issues, you know, sat down and said, Sister Instructor, how are you doing tonight? It's really good to see you. We're going to have a good night. And I thought, you know what? If he can come out with a good attitude and, a, and good spirit, I got no complaints. Mm. So, but no, I've never thought about about stopping. That's never been a issue. I've had points where, in the past three or four years, where you know physical stuff happens. I went through, you know, 
um, heart problems and heart surgeries. And there's things that I can't do now that I used to, you know, I've thought about what good am I to the dojo? Mm. But then I've got a, a, a grandmaster, Doshu Allen, that says, you know what, no matter what you can do physically, your experience and the stuff you give to this dojo makes you valuable to this dojo. Yeah. So, and, and that's in times like that, I fall back on that. I say, you know what, I'm giving back all I can give back and I'm not going to stop doing that. Yeah. Let's talk about that heart stuff because you and I have talked about that in the mm-hmm. past and I know that that was uh, a difficult and an emotional time for you because it reduced what you can do even now, but I recall it taking you away for a time and you expressed to me how, how challenging that was. So can you talk to that? Yeah. They, um, once they, once they did the, cause it, it wound up, it was a, a, a thing that I was born with and I didn't know I had. Mm. So ran a marathon and started having, you know, issues that I hadn't had before. So I went and I said, well, it's a hole in your heart. So we have to go in and fix that. So they went in and then that added to other issues that come along with all that stuff. I was out for seven months. Wow. Couldn't go to the dojo. Couldn't, you know. And, and prior to that, what was the longest break? To, you know, maybe a week's vacation or something. What was the longest you'd stepped away? Two or three days. Oh, okay. So two or three days to a seven month vacation. If I was in the state, I was at a class. Mm. A week would be as long as it would be when I went out of state to see family from West Virginia. But that that would be that's the longest that I would be out of that dojo. And I was at that dojo two to three days a week Mm. for three classes at a time, either helping, teaching or participating in class. Sure. Then when you add in tournaments that, and this season, like every other weekend. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, you know, so no, that's, 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 I, it, it was a, I'm not going to say a big, it, it was my life at the time, mm-hmm. that dojo. My, my personal family and the dojo, that, that was it. So when you take half of that away and I'm sitting at home, that's when the mental training comes in to play. Mm. As to you, you, if, if I felt like I was being, getting in a dark place, I would start going over katas in my mind. I would start thinking about students that were at the dojo and how they were progressing. But you also have to add in the fact, the dojo itself, even though I wasn't there, calls from instructors, calls from students wanting to know how I was doing and when I was coming back. People checking on you because you alive. said they were their family. Right. Still a lifeline. Hmm. Did you go watch it all? I went to some promotions. Okay. Some black belt promotions. Um, you have to remember, my wife has gotten to know me more now mm-hmm. since I've been doing this and I've been more accessible to them. So she knows me. She knows if I go to that dojo, during a class, uh, I'm going to be in that class. I can't help it. I can't stay out of it. So she, she would say she, nope. she was your supervisor. She but, yeah, kept yeah, you from absolutely. making that, that decision. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. What was it like going back in after that break? To be honest with you, like part of it was like, I never left. But then when I get into a class, then I have to adapt. So that's a challenge. I have to adapt to the stuff that I 
can no longer do and adjust it to stuff that I can do. Mm. And my grandmaster and the other people in the dojo learn to read me. Mm. And they will come up and say, Richie, don't you think it's time you took a break? Or Doshu will say, Renji, you step off to the side and help me watch the line. Mm -hmm. And then I had to adjust to the fact that, okay, people are watching you now. Mm -hmm. Or they think you are helpless now. And that's not the fact. That's not, that's not what is happening. What is happening is, they care about me and want to keep me there and keep me around. How challenging was it to wrap your head around that as someone who seems to be very action oriented? That is still challenging today. Yeah. Five years in, it's still challenging because in here, this heart is still 10 feet tall and bulletproof, right? Yeah. This body is not. So I have to learn when to follow my heart and when to listen to my body. And for a stubborn man, which I am, that's 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 a big challenge. And that's a challenge I have to deal with every day. But I learned and I learned something really, really important. When you've got a doctor that looks at you and says, you should not be here. This, this should have taken you out. You should not be here. And you're, you're, you're a blessed man. You're, you know, something is watching over you. You're here for a reason. And all the stuff you're going through is there's a reason for this, whether it be someone else needs to see this or whether it be, you know, whatever. But I have to live my life in that mode that, yeah, there, there's, there, there's a reason I'm still here. So I want to stay here and finish what I started mm. and finish giving back to what this has given me and what this has given me. And we live our, we, we live in the dojo. We live our life on these things, honor, respect, loyalty, trust, and integrity. And I want to keep giving that. And I want other people to see that. So that's what I'm going to keep doing. <laughs> it can be really easy with a story like yours to look and say, you know, martial arts has given you so much. Let's, if only you'd found it sooner. But I, I believe things happen in their own time. So the question is, would you have been ready if that friend had come to you a year or two ahead? Or if somebody, you know, in your teen years when you were, maybe mm -hmm. a bit more rough and tumble and right. said, I think this would be a good thing for you. Would you have been open to it? Absolutely not. I would have a year before that, I would have laughed at him. Wow. A year before that, you have to remember, the only thing I knew of martial arts is what I saw on that television. I had to be in that low place. I had to be at the bottom looking up and I had to be trying to grab for something, anything in order to give that a chance. Cause I wouldn't have, and, and my wife made the, the, um, point of my first promotion where I was just getting a stripe on my white belt mm. three months in brand new. 
they came to the promotion. My wife and my, my two children, they came to see that promotion. Just remember, when we enter the dojo, we bow. To the instructors on deck, we bow. My wife said, I would never in my wildest imaginations have seen you bowing to any man, to anyone. And I sat down and I said, well, it's not that I'm bowing to anyone. We are bowing to each other in a mutual respect. I said, that, that's the whole key is respect. I said, Toshu's not trying to control me, to put his thumb on me. Toshu's giving me tools that I can use to be the type of husband and father that you guys deserve. So and explaining it that way, she's she then she's then she you know uh, would understand more. I'm looking up right now because I want to I want to double check. Yeah, um, I've known your instructor. I've known Joshu Viernes for a little bit longer than I've known you, and and he was gracious enough to come on this show. Mm -hmm. episode 11 to give listeners an idea how how long ago that was and it, it, it's a um, absolutely wonderful episode i think it's important to talk about him a little bit not not because he is your instructor i mean sometimes on the show we will do that right. but because the transformation that you had was was yes due to martial arts but you also being in an environment that allowed you to do that work. There's a culture to your school that, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know the majority of people who come on the show, but when I do know a bit about the people who come on the show and, and their story, I'll inject it as we are here. Not everyone, not every school, not every instructor would have been appropriate. You know, you, in a sense, right. were lucky that you mm -hmm. ended up where you did. Can you talk about him, your relationship with him, and the culture of the school for the relevance to your growth? Right. So the culture of the school is nobody sits on the bench. No matter what your physical ability, everybody's given the chance. to participate and to grow in that dojo. And if this dojo is, and it's not like your traditional, it is traditional, but it's not. It's not like the old school where if you move, you push up. If you do, if you're not really paying attention, push up. They have a way of bringing the student into and like we have a lot of younger students. We have a lot of students with ADHD, with um, um, autistic and, and you know, um, mm. limited abilities. We don't stand over that student and say, you're not standing the right way. You need to do this right now. We go up to that student and we a, make eye contact. We have a we have a, a a way of operating where it's praise, correct, praise. First, tell them they're doing a good job. Second, saying, OK, buddy, now can we stand like this? Can you put your foot right here and let's. Focus right in on the instructor. Good job. Not a belittling and a, a, a you're not doing the right thing at the right time attitude. And Doshu is 
ex army ranger. Yeah. <laughs> and he has and, a prep to, to anyone who has not met him. Right. Uh, if you haven't listened to his episode, he has a presence yes. that can, it, you cannot, even if he's quiet, even if yes. he's just standing there, he has a presence. Yes. And when I started getting close to Doshu, was I, uh, at that first tournament that I was, that I participated in, and I work at the facility that the tournament was, so I know where everything is. There was stuff happening that I knew how to correct. Mm -hmm. So I took that opportunity and I corrected the things that needed to be corrected because I knew where everything was as far as tables, chairs, stuff to clean up stuff, you know, stuff like that. I went in and, you know, in the office and uh, told Doshu, I says, well, you know, uh, thank you for allowing me to be you know, in the tournament and allowing me to help at the tournament. The first thing he said was, your family now, bud. Right. So that that in itself made me at ease saying, you know, and mine and Doshu's relationship is, yes, he's my grandmaster. He trained me and is training. And I respect completely his position in the dojo. Mm. But he's also a friend and family. And we'll treat you as family. And we'll help you in any way. Any a lot of other schools, when I went through what I went through, a lot of schools, if it was full contact and all that, you know, would have set me on the bench. Would have said, okay, well, you can't do anything now. Doshu said, okay, well, you can do this. You know, we still need you. We still need your your experience. We still need your teaching. You know, it's it's a family dojo. If that makes sense, it's it's it there. There are no strangers that come into that dojo. The minute you enter that dojo, there's somebody there saying, hi, how are you doing? Welcome to our dojo. And giving you a welcoming into our family, if that makes sense. Yeah. The way you talked about teaching, I think, warrants going back and, and unpacking that a little bit. First off, when when did you start assisting? When I was a blue belt. Okay, so pretty early. Yes. What was that like? That, so I went into helping thinking, okay, you do this, this, and this. You get that student to do this, this, and this. That is so far from the truth that it is, my first class was with the little dragons, helping Doshu with the little dragons class. That's, four to seven year olds in a to put a little bit of 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 um, a little more levity on the situation sometimes it's like hurting cats <laughs> because they're four years old they're seven years old they're yeah. five six you have to learn that yes they're in a martial arts dojo but this kid's five this kid cannot stand and be still for any length of time. So you cannot berate that child. But my first or second class, I came out in a full sweat. Mm. Like I'd had a workout, full sweat. I sat down in the waiting room and again, Richie Richard comes out and sits next to me and he's chit chatting. And I says, man, I just don't know. I don't know if this is, if I'm going to be able to do this because they're not going to get it. They're just not, I don't know how this is going to work. And he said, you have to realize something. I said, what's that? He said, they don't know why they're here yet. They don't know what this is going to give them. They don't know why they're here. They don't know their purpose. So you have to be strong 
and be kind and gentle to help them find their purpose. So then that said, oh, okay, so it's not all physical. It's not about doing a roll the right way. It's not about doing a kick exactly the way it should be. It's about this child is four years old and he's trying to execute a front kick. He's four. That kick's not going to look anything like it's supposed to. (laughs) But if you keep being a doing this with kindness, one day the light's going to click. And not only is he going to be able to execute these moves, he's going to know why he's here. And I say this all the time, and I say this to my classes. Everybody knows why they started, whether it be, like me, a distraction for a little while. Or you want to get in better shape. Once you get to a certain point in your training, whether it be brown belt, black belt, whatever, then you realize why you why you stay. And the reason I stay is I am always for the rest of my life going to have, people call them issues, I call them demons. I'm always going to have them. They're always going to be there. The old me is still sitting in the wind waiting for the new me to screw up and he can take over. This gives me the tools to form the links in the chain to keep the old me and the demons chained up. If anybody that was in my shape tells you those demons disappear they are lying because they are always there it's always going to be i wake up in the morning and i choose the attitude i have a whole list of them i choose the attitude that is going to help me be the type of person that my family and my friends want to be around or deserve to be around. Mm. And sometimes it's a difficult day. Sometimes the demons raise their head and I feel those old feelings. I have the right to have those moments and to set and let those moments for a second be there. But I have the choice to push those back and be me, if that makes sense. So what's next? Keep giving back. Keep. I can never repay martial arts, doshu, hanchi, you, for what you've given me. But I can sure keep trying. And that's, and, and when you see these young, young ones, these young students, and I watch them, I've literally watched students grow up in our dojo. And a lot of them are still there. And a lot of them are helping. And a lot of them are instructing. And if I had any part in that, then that makes me proud. And that's what I want to continue doing for as long as I can walk in the door. This is one of my favorite questions, and it feels really appropriate here. Say we find a time machine. Mm -hmm. You can go back and spend, you know, a few minutes with yourself on you know the day that you're going to try class or the day before 
and you can say something to that you at I, I believe you said 42 what mm -hmm. would you say stay strong and get ready because it's going to be one great ride what would you say to the people listening or watching you know what what thoughts might you have for them knowing that they are at different points in their martial arts journey some of them like yourself are battling demons mm -hmm. some of them are reaching well i mean we're all getting older nobody's getting younger oh, yeah. but some of them have some physical stuff that mm -hmm. maybe limits what they can do you know that this this very broad group what do you want to say to them so you're going to come to a point where all this stuff is going to close in on you and you're going to be sitting and thinking Goodness, man, I have to go to the dojo. Put it in the perspective perspective of you have a choice. You don't have to. You don't have to. You get to. You get to go. And if you are in this for any length of time, sit down and ask yourself why you're doing it. Why are you doing it? Are you doing it because you have to? Or are you doing it because you get to? If you're doing it because you have to, you need to step back and reevaluate your purpose as to why you're there. And if you're doing it because you feel you have to, you're doing your students and your family and yourself a disservice. Because martial arts can, you, you get out of it what you put into it. And um, martial art, the one thing it's taught me is you have to adapt. So if you have physical limitations, you have to adapt. And you have to trust your instructors, your grandmasters, your friends in the dojo. You have to trust them enough to sit down and say, all right, these are my physical limitations. This is what I cannot do. Let's sit down and figure out what I can do. It's not, it's not about what you can't do. And if you have physical problems, it is real easy to sit down, sit there or wallow in that and, and say, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. I had to say, well, but I can do this. I can go teach class, helping class. I can help clean up the dojo. I can go to tournaments and sit and judge. I can do that. I am blessed where I can still do my forms. I can still do my weapons. I can still do some of the activity. But if there ever comes a time where I can't, then I still have to look at, but I can still go there. I can still help in class. I can still teach. I can still give this, give martial arts something. And if I am, and I don't believe I ever will get to the point where I say I can't give them something. I, I just refuse to believe that. I always want to believe that I can give back something and everybody can give back something. But you have to put yourself in the mindset of it's not about me. It's about what it has given me not so much about what I can do it's about what it's given me and if I can give this much then I pay back something it's a it's a it's all about paying back for the life that it's given me 
Like I can sit down now and have a talk with my children and not yell and scream and, and get to know them more. I wasted a whole lot of time where I was staunch and I said, nope, this is the way it's going to be and stop doing that. And, you know, now I'm like, oh, you want to go run and do that? Okay, well, let's go. You want to jump in some leaves? Okay, let's do that. You know, I can do that now because I like myself a little bit. If that makes any sense. I think one of the things that I enjoy most about this episode in my conversation with Joe is that our conversation shows it's never too late. You can always reinvent who you are. And if you want to be a better person, there's a path. It can be martial arts. I think martial arts is one of, if not the most effective methods to personal growth. But there's always a choice. And when we choose, to grow, we can grow, but we can't grow unless we choose to. So Joe, thanks for coming on. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Listeners, check out the show notes. They're in your podcast app or at whistlecakemartialartsradio.com and consider supporting us in our work to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artist. Share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, maybe contribute to the Patreon. Now, if you want to bring me to your school, have me teach a seminar, we can do that. Just let me know. Or perhaps you have a topic or a guest suggestion, some other sort of feedback. Reach out to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere. That brings us to the end. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.